Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special video where I am going to be talking with Marina Burrell. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Diana, the goddess Diana, and the asteroid, a little bit about the asteroid Diana. And specifically, we're talking about this for two reasons. One is because Verena has written a manuscript of a book about Diana. It's incredibly beautiful. I've had a chance to look at it and it's amazing and I cannot wait for it to be published. Um, and then the reason number two is that Verena and I will be hosting a workshop on Diana on, on September 14th, 2022 which will be held at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time on September 14th. And you are very warmly invited to join us live or to have the recording at any time you want afterward. So more information will be linked in this video for that workshop. But everything we're gonna be talking about today is essentially a precursor to that workshop. And for some of you, this, this talk will be just exactly what you need and be really beautiful, rich, wonderful content. And then for others of you, you'll you'll know it and you'll feel called to come to this workshop on September 14th. Um, and Verena and I have other things planned later down the line as well about other goddesses. And um, so we'll say more about that another time, but it's really, really wonderful to be connecting with Verena. You're such a gift to the world. Thank you so much for being here with me. Oh, thank you so much, Martha, that we are together here. And yeah, I'm so, so excited for everything that comes. Um, our Diana workshop, our other goddess magic that is still in the making. And I'm just so grateful and thankful that we met and that I am part of your beautiful symposium. And I already enjoyed our first talk um, the soul has no gender so much. And now I'm super excited and honored to talk about Diana. And I'm really, really grateful that you give me or Diana the opportunity to yeah, be, be heard because mm -hmm. Diana really wants to be heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, so before we start, I wanna get, say a little bit more about you and also say a little bit more about why this matters to me. <laughs> And the coincidence or the not coincidence between you and me with the goddesses and with Diana. So um, I, two years ago, channeled the, my first draft of my fourth, I'm actually technically my fifth book um, called Goddesses Speak. And Diana is one of the goddesses that is in that book. And, um, and then you happen to have written this book on specifically on Diana. And when we compared what we have written or we're actually well mine is channeled yours is feels pretty close to channel yeah like a mix it, it right felt, I, i'm wondering who has written that yeah it's yeah. a mix it's a mix <laughs> yeah but it they the 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 i want to say like the vibration of them yeah. is the, the the feeling of them is the essence of them yeah. so similar <laughs> like I was, went back and read my Diana section in my Goddess of Speak book, and I had looked at your Diana book, and I, it was like almost the same color paint, you know, like something, I don't know how to put it, but it was so beautiful to see them like that. Um, yeah, oh, what, you were going to say something? Yeah, reading your chapter about Diana um, really encouraged me that my that what I was told to write down and what I felt about her is really true. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when I did this book, I read, um, I read um, texts about Artemis Diana, the archetype, but not so much. There are not really books around the asteroid goddess Diana. And so there is, that's really it came through me or I was open to receive that. And that I, I, all, I often had this feeling of, okay, am I complete? Is it, is it true? Am I allowed to write that down? Is it, is it something or am I just 
is it just my subjective view of her? And your, um, your channel chapter showed me that what I received and what I part channeled, part um, yeah, um, learned about Diana and the chart um, by, with, with client sessions and so on, that it's actually, I'm not, I, I did not write something wrong. So it, it feels very resonate. And when I read your chapter, it was like reading the essence of my book. And um, yeah, I really heard her. Wow. So yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> and it had the same effect. Reading yours had a similar effect on me, um, except that your book goes so much more in depth. And yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, just to quickly say a little more about you so we can introduce you a little more. You, so Verena is an evolutionary astrologer and obviously an author. And Verena and I are both students of Ari Moshe Wolf. And Verena, you also are a student of Sabrina Monarch. Yeah. And um, so we both do evolutionary astrologer, uh, astrology. I would say my astrology also incorporates a lot of other things, but uh, <clears throat> anyway, that's part of where we're both coming from in our, in our approach to this talk on Diana. And, um, and then I, the other thing I want to highlight is that one thing that's similar about you and me and what we're going to be holding space for in this workshop on September 14th is that we, we both approach astrology and specifically these goddess archetypes and all I'll speak for myself, all archetypes in a way that is about ourselves as those energies. So the embodiment of them. Um, so one of the things we're going to be doing in the workshop is we'll be going, you know, pretty deeply into the meaning of Diana and the asteroid of Diana. And then we'll be talking about Diana through the asteroid, through the, the various zodiac signs. But we're, then we're also going to do what um what the spirit world has is really calling me to do which is to help people remember that we are literally the energy of infinity which then configures as infinite manifestations of the divine including these archetypes so so we are we literally are diana we are every other archetype in existence. And when we re-become each of these archetypes, such as Diana, she can be us. She can speak as us. The wisdom of her becomes us. And that specific wisdom of Diana or of any archetype can only come through specifically us in each moment. So there is there's a there's a wisdom of Diana and any ar archetype that ne is needing to be expressed as each of us in every moment. And we can only know that by experiencing it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And nobody can teach it to us either, right? But we can hold space for that to come through. So that's part of the intention of the workshop is to not only to, I mean, number one, to learn about Diana, but then also to, in a sense, re-become her and learn what is that wisdom? What is that healing? What is that ancient deep knowledge that is already, it already is us. How can we bring that forward? And, and what is, what do we need that that energy is there to help us with or, and how can we even serve that energy too, both ways? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Martha, what I just want to add is that I really love how you describe it because I think when we really consciously invite the spirit, we awaken that Diana is in us and we can awaken her, but we can also invite her energy to come to us and to support us. And why Diana now, um, we will talk about that in our workshop, but I think that it's no coincidence that her archetype came to me and 
it's not about my personal journey, not only, it's really about the collective journey. And Diana offers so much healing energy for our current time. And I think that on a personal and on a collective level, Diana is really a guide and a door opener being at the threshold to the Aquarian age. And she can really help us to evolve. And um, what I wanted to say is that about the workshop that I think both of us are so much about this balance between left and right brain and the whole body and soul and energy body and everything. So it's really our approach and our idea is really that we in the at the beginning talk really about the astrology of Diana. So it's really about the zodiac signs. We do some chart examples so that we really become a feeling of Diana as an asteroid that is in the cosmos and that we have in our chart and um, the, the personal um, facet and shade that Diana has through the different archetypes, but then also drop into the body and really embody it and feel the goddess and connect with the goddess. And my personal goal, and I'm sure that is your, yours as well, is that really after the workshop that you are as a participant um, able to work and play with Diana and really um, um, yeah, awaken her in your everyday life and really we set the seed for your connection to Diana within you. Yeah. And yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So today I think what we're going to be doing is you're going to be, Verena is going to be giving a, a gist of what is Diana? Why do we care about this particular energy? And you and I happen to have the Diana asteroid very prominent in our particular chart so we might talk about that a little bit if it feels right but um yeah anyway so that's what that's what we're going to be talking about here in this video and um, yeah go for it <laughs> shall we start i think it's maybe as a as a as to say that at the beginning i will dive a little bit deeper into the myth of diana because I think it is really important to understand her myth and the two different myths around Diana, the pre-Hellenic and the Hellenic myths, to really have the complete picture of her archetype, mm -hmm. because she's not only goddess of the hunt, if you think that. Mm -hmm. um, so I will dive deeper into the myth and then, um, yeah, we, we talk about our Diana experiences. So I share my screen. Second. Do you see the presentation? Yes, and it's so beautiful. Yes. And <laughs> that, like yeah, the picture, um, um, I painted this. Mm. Um, I painted, um, yeah, my goal was to paint the pictures for the book by myself. So, mm. yeah. Okay, yes, about the presentation, as you already mentioned, uh, Martha, my talk is based on my unreleased book, Asteroid Goddess Diana, Rewild Your Soul and Reclaim Your True Nature. And the book includes channel texts and poems, but also research-based information about Diana's myth and descriptions of asteroid Diana in the 12 astrological archetypes. So, what I wanted to mention too is that because you said that I, um, yeah, my main teacher is, is Ari and Sabrina Monarch. And I just wanted to thank Sabrina at the beginning of the presentation because it was um, in her material read class that we were, um, we had the possibility, the opportunity to do a um, creative project around astrology and so I decided to do my astrology project last year in 2021 about Diana so it was really um Sabrina was kind of giving me the holding the space for this whole creative um yeah project 
Okay, that is really important for me yeah. <laughs> to mention yeah. that. Yeah. Um, first of all, Diana or Artemis, um, the original name of Diana, which is the Latin name, is Artemis. That is the Greek, um, the Greek mythology is older than the um, um, Latin mythology. So the original name is Artemis. And when you research for Diana, you will find stories around Artemis. But for brevity, I will use the name Diana in today's talk. And my whole um, research is about the asteroid Diana, just to make this clear. And as a little introduction into the archetype, I wanted to read a little poem about Diana from the book. And you are invited to maybe just close your eyes and listen. I'm Diana, goddess of the hunt, goddess of the moon. My story reaches long in the past, but I'm here in the now, inside the soil, inside your soul. Become aware, become awake. I have always been here and will guide you on your way. I want to be awakened and I want you to awaken. Awaken to the wilderness of your soul the nature of your heart. I want you to liberate your brain so that your mind can fly free like the birds in the woods and the eagle in the sky. I want you to unlock the door from your limiting box so that you can leave the shelter of the noun. I want you to explore the woods, discover new territories, reclaim forgotten lands, find freedom in your forests. I want you to run with your dogs play with the nymphs, reach for your goals, shoot for your stars. I want you to cuddle with bears and dance with deer. I want you to bath in the beams of the waxing moon and grow to your fullest light. I want you to live your wild side and explore your nature, your truth, your soul. So beautiful. Yeah, more about my sources, just to say that really quick, um, my book and this presentation are based on several materials, messages from Diana, the birth charts that is coming in the workshop, so not today, and books about Diana Smith and archetype. So these books are not about the asteroid Diana, but about the myth and the archetype. So if you want to, you can screenshot um, this presentation slide um, and when you are interested in Diana's archetype, these books are really nice. Yeah. Um, and um, I want to thank not only Sabrina Monarch, who I already mentioned, um, but also Rebecca M. Farah. Um, she has held a presentation about asteroid virgin goddesses for the Astrology of Awakening Summit in April 2020. And that was the first time that I heard about asteroid. Diana. So I really want to thank Rebecca um, for that too. So as I already mentioned, there are two different mythology around Diana. So we have on the one hand, the pre-Hellenic original myth, and on the other hand, the classical Olympian myth. And in the pre-Hellenic original myth, she's goddess of untamed nature, goddess of fertility, and the moon, protectors of animals and goddess of childbirth. And the classical myth is a little bit similar, but slightly different. So there she is, Apollo's sister, goddess of the hunt, warrior goddess, protectress of girls and goddess of the moon and of childbirth too. So this is a quote by Charlene Spretnak. Artemis or Diana lived with her nymphs amid the thick wild growth where animals joined freely in her games and dances. She loved new life. Whether at play or at rest, Artemis was ever alert for the rising moans of a mother giving birth. And that is about the original myth of Artemis, Diana. So just to, yeah, to give you a little bit of a background when we look about asteroid goddesses in general and Diana and goddess cultures. 
So I think it is very important to take the pre-Hellenic mythology of Diana and of goddesses in general um, into consideration when we talk about their archetypes, because the goddesses are rooted in cultures where matrifocal cosmology was the common worldview, a life in harmony with natural cycles and Mother Earth. And women and the great goddess were seen as the only source of creation. So at that time, humanity did not know that men have an equal part of the procreation process. So giving birth was really a wonder. And therefore, women were seen as the source of life. And the great goddess was, yeah, was bringing life and death and was everything that is. And um, yeah, within the goddess cults and cultures, the body, nature, source and spirit were considered and honored as union. It was a culture of integration instead of separation. And after the destruction of the goddess culture by Northern conquerors that started around 2500 before Christ, the goddesses were disempowered and displaced by male gods. So we have this shift within the myths. And the problem is that the original myths were mainly forgotten because of their oral tradition. So we know the classical myths because they were written down by authors like Homer and Hesiod. So Diana's pre-Hellenic myth, we start with that. And Martha, if you have any questions, um, just interrupt me. Um, in the pre-Hellenic myth, Diana is known as Lady of the Beast. So we have early graphics of Diana where she is depicted in harmony with animals and nature. She's flanked by or in an ecstatic dance with animals. Yeah, this is in contrast to later images where she is usually shown as huntress with killed animals. And um, she, Diana is known as protectress of animals and goddess of birth. So um, the myth tells us that Diana helped pregnant animals and women with leaves of the herb Artemisia, which is a mugwort, to bring their children to life. And she is a fertility goddess and goddess of the waxing moon. So Diana's dancing festivities started when the moon was young and continued until the night before the full moon. And then in the night before the full moon, Diana's dances reached their climax. And Diana's friends, animals, mortals, and immortals built a circle around a large tree in the silvery moonlight. And the dancing goddess touched the tree with her hands so that blossoms unfolded and turned into ripe fruits that she harvested to feed her friends and herself. Then the wild dance intensified. They danced ecstatically, turned faster and faster, joined hands, merged bodies so that sparks of energy flew from their fingertips. Everybody, the animals, the plants, the trees, pulsed with life so that finally the whole forest quivered with energy. Diana was in the middle of the sacred and joyful dance until she was one with the moon tree. Then the circle broke. Everyone lay down on the mossy floor of the forest. From there, they could observe the stars, where goddess Selene appeared in her chariot and pulled the full moon across the sky. So this is one of these original myths around Artemis Diana, and this um, Charlene Spretnak has written that down in Lost Goddesses of Early Greece. So now we come to the adaption of Diana to patriarchy. And I think it's really important that we um, are really clear about these mythology from the Hellenic times because all classical myths were all written by male poets like Homer, like Hesiod. That means we have a lens that comes from already an culture where patri patriarchal rules and hierarchies were, yeah, the baseline or the conditionings. So I think we should take the pre-Hellenic and the classical myths into consideration. So both are important for us to explore Diana's archetype because we live and we lived 
within patriarchal systems. So the classical goddess archetypes can mirror qualities and trauma that we find within ourselves, within our soul's history, from past lives and our current upbringing. So both mythologies are relevant. And Diana's main qualities were slightly changed within the Olympian myth. And Diana was um, mainly overshadowed by her twin brother, Apollo, god of the sun. So there was the goddess, god of the sun, and then she was the goddess of the moon. And she's already, she's always the sister, just the sister. And she became the goddess of the hunt. And she's often depicted with her killed prey. But um, before that, in the um, original myth, she's completely the protectress of animals and the nurturer of animals. Then in the um, classic myths, she becomes yeah, this warrior goddess, this um, goddess of the hunt. But even in the classical myths, and this is really important, um, she never kill killed female animals to protect the species. So she is aware of her responsibility as huntress that the animals are not dying all, so that she's really aware of her, her responsibility. And her moon dances turned into weapon dances, so she was known for her merciless rage. She, become the pro she became the protectress of young girls and women who were persecuted by men. This idea of persecution by men is not existing in the pre-Hellenic myth, so we don't have that. And in the Hellenic myth, she is this strong female archetype that really, um, yeah, um, saves women in need. And she was still known as goddess of childbirth and as moon goddess. So what is Diana's classical myth? Um, as I already mentioned, even though Diana's reons changed, she kept a unique position in the classical myth. So she is this untamed androgynous virgin goddess who lived according to her, her own rules and far away from Mount Olympus. She was never raped or humiliated by man. And most of the other goddesses are at some point of their stories humiliated or raped. Diana was the daughter of the Titan goddess Leto and the king of gods, Zeus, Jupiter. And Jupiter, as very often in the myth, betrayed his wife Juno with Leto. And because of that, Juno turned her rage onto Leto. So Juno sent the Python of Delphi to chase the pregnant Leto across the land so that she could not rest and give birth. And Leto finally found refuge on the island of Delos. And after birthing Diana, Juno's rage continued. Leto was unable to give birth to Apollo, the twin brother of Diana. And so what did Diana, baby Diana, midwifed her awakened mother so that Apollo finally saw the light of day. And when Diana was three years old, so Diana was raised together with Apollo by her mother. And when she was three years old, she met her daddy, Jupiter, and she immediately requested a bow and arrow, 80 nymphs as playmates, a pack of hunting dogs, and a short tunica so that she could run around easily. And later in her life, she claimed her eternal chastity. She was known as a proud huntress. So she was known for her hunting skills and her ambition. And there's one myth about Diana and Orion. And yeah, she even killed her friend Orion by an accident because she confused him with an animal. And she did not take the time to have a second look because she was so obsessed with proving her speed and hunting skills. So here is already, we see already a shadowy quality within her archetype as every archetype has and more destructive sites. And the merciless rage of Diana is described in many stories. So she has the sacred anger. As virgin goddess, she protected women who were in danger of being raped. Diana saved them and punished the persecuted, persecutors in a very cruel way. 
And together with her brother, Apollo, Diana also revenged her mother, who was humiliated in different situations by humans and gods. So we have this strong protectress. So what are the differences? In the original mythology, she was in harmony with nature, animals, humans, and Mother Earth. She helped humans and animals give birth. She helped nature bloom and create new life. In the classical mythology, she was a proud huntress and ambitious archer. She protected girls and women against violation. She was known for her merciless rage. Bringing it all together, Diana was an untamed virgin goddess and lived in the wilderness of nature. She was the goddess of childbirth and she helped pregnant women and, women and animals. She protected women and animals in need, especially against the violation of men. She was best friend with every soul she liked. Maybe we can talk about that later in depth. Independent from gender, status, species. Diana did not care about given standards and conformity. She followed her natural instincts, her intuition, truth, and gnosis. She balanced daytime and night nighttime consciousness. So she has a very balanced yin and yang. She is huntress, which is more this daytime consciousness, and she is a moon goddess, which is her side as, yeah, with the nighttime con consciousness. And she decided unapologetically what was right for her and chose independently from authority figures or Olympian rules to say from conditionings and from society. Diana embodied an untamed wild spirit who nurtured and protected nature. Even as a huntress, she was aware of, her, of, of maintaining the survival of species and saved mother animals. And now again, the picture of Diana. Who is Diana? Untamed, wild, and authentic. Self-conscious, self-reliant, and brave. Independent and autonomous. Playful and sociable. Supportive and protective. Intuitive and instinctual. She's goal-oriented, focused, ambitious, androgynous, and she has this balanced nighttime and daytime consciousness. She's connected to nature and animals, and she is devoted to her own rules and values. Why Diana wants to be heard. Um, and this is something I think we wanna go deeper within our workshop, but I really want just to, to mention some of the points that are, as I see it as really relevant, why she wants to be heard now. One point is that she's, from my point of view, really connected with um, concepts around animism. So Diana really teaches us to save our nature and Mother Earth. So she is she embodies this idea that everything and every every living and not living um, entity on this yeah in this universe is connected, and that we are part of nature, that we are nature, and that we should not separate ourselves from our body, from nature, from Mother Earth, and destroy it because it's outside of us. Because when we destroy our body, Mother Earth, the environment, we destroy ourselves. So this concept around animism is so, yeah, it's such an, Diana is such a, such a um, symbol for that idea. And another concept that is really important is the idea of androgyny. So Diana shows us that the soul has no gender. So she is within herself, and maybe we talk about that a little bit, Martha. Um, she is within herself. She has such a balance between yin and yang. And together with her brother, Apollo, who has, um, from a traditional point of view, more feminine quote-unquote um, facets he is god of music and art and she was really beautiful and Diana is this strong muscular goddess who can 
yeah, who's wild and is in the woods. So both together also symbolize very, yeah, balanced androgen, um, androgynous archetypes. And um, Diana is good friend and with, with every soul, it does not matter if it's a man, a woman, an animal, a human, non-human. Um, so she really loves the soul and she hates women, men too. So her rage is not only against men or not only against, so she, she, yeah, she's really completely independent from this idea around gender. And um, another important point is um, that Diana can help us to trust our intuition and our instincts. And we will differentiate um, a little bit maybe in the workshop what the difference between intuition and instincts is. Um, but it's really about this um, following your own nature and not um, yeah, giving your power away because of um, certain conditionings. And this is, fl flows into the last and from my point of view, most important point, the idea of rewilding. It's really about the empowerment to liberate from patriarchy and from systems that oppress our soul's nature and oppress our own power so that we really come back to this true essence of our soul, our nature, what really feels natural to us, what really feels natural to us in the relationship to other people, to other souls, to our work, to our whole structure of life, what really feels natural and where we are doing something because we think we have to do that or we think we have to um, fulfill expectations of others or where, where we have certain gender or um, relationship roles in our head that we think we have to um, be that or that we are actually not aware that we are living something that is not natural for us. So Diana really shakes us and wakes us up and asks us, is this natural for you? Are you living in your own wild woods or do you try to, um, yeah, try to um, hide your untamed spirit in order to fit in? Yeah, and just, just to close it down and then I really want to talk um, with you, um, Martha, about Diana. And as I said, um, we, we will go more in depth into the relevance and important um, in the workshop. So I have, yeah, some more slides around these different concepts. Um, yeah, Diana can be a door opener and an ally for us. Together with her strong and loving energy, we can enter the portal into a new world where every soul and our whole living cosmos comes back to their true nature and rewilds from the suffering, repression, and exploitation of the past. And the evolutionary intent of Diana is the rewilding of the soul, the reclamation of our true nature and the return to natural law that always balances our personal desire with the greatest good for all, mother earth, nature and the whole universe. Yeah, and this is the end of this very short introduction it's more of an introduction about her archetype um yeah but i think it's it, it it was a good intro um to get a sense who this energy of diana comes from and what she what her myth already transports as topics and themes and um yeah all so beautiful and it also reminded me of some another point I wanted to make about you and also me and our approach to the god well, our approach to astrology and our approach to the goddesses in particular is um you you're referencing two of the classic books that of course I read also you know a few years ago when I was researching for my goddesses speak book which is uh the goddess asteroid book by Demetra George and also the Jean Boleyn book Goddesses and Every Woman 
And both of those books are wonderful, amazing. But you and I have talked about, you know, I'll speak for myself, that those books are also 30 years old. And so I know for me, when I was first reading them a few years ago, I, I, on the one hand, I felt really grateful that they existed. And I felt, I want to say offended. I don't know if offended is quite the right word, because it's certainly not an intent, intention to be offensive at all in those, at all. <laughs> um, but they felt very outdated and they felt mm -hmm. very uh, focused on one particular cultural perspective, which I happen to relate to, but I happen to be of that culture, right? And most people aren't. So I, in my approach to these goddess archetypes and to just life in general, it's so key and so important that we bring this all up to date and that we bring it into the light of much more diversity, much more awareness that Diana manifests through literally all of life no matter who you are, no matter what gender you are, no matter what sexual orientation, no matter what cultural background, no matter what time and space you live in, all of these things. And so we, you and I have talked a lot about um, even writing about that in the future, you know, and many ideas, <laughs> but um, that's really, really important to me. And I feel very deeply passionate about that. And so that's part of what I love about what you just shared is that I feel like the spirit of what you're sharing is 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 present it resonates for me personally here and now and i feel like it it can be relevant on a much broader scale than let's say what i read in jean belen's book you know which again i so grateful for it but don't want to put it down at all um but i just feel like you're bringing it up to to you know 2022 and beyond and yeah it's really really beautiful and important for me I totally agree to that, Martha. And I'm so, so thankful for um, yeah, Dimitra George for her work. And um, these books are like, um, I think that I, they give us the ground mm -hmm. and the baseline. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, really the ground to evolve. Mm -hmm. And I think that all of the goddess archetypes and I think Diana is very special within that. I said to that a little bit later more, but um, I think that all archetypes in general are evolving with us. Yes. And they, they are, as we know in evolutionary astrology, everything is evolving. So the archetypes are evolving too. And every soul has its connection to the archetypal energies that is very unique and i think that these um, books that you mentioned are really important but it's really it's also important to not take them as bibles and as written down and uh, it's really important to take them as introduction to explore these archetypes in ourselves and especially with the goddesses i'm Oh, I'm super, super, it's super, super important for me to always say that it's not about women. It's, not, we all have the asteroid goddesses in our chart, every soul, every living being, they are, they are. And it's, even when I talk about the feminine principle or when I said Diana and she in this presentation, <clears throat> It's not about um, the gender or the identification as woman. It's really about an energy that is completely independent and from gender. And I think that why I love Diana so much and why I think that she is so important, especially within the whole goddess um, within the whole goddess um, room or goddess circle. She's so important because she, for me, embodies and she is a goddess. That means she has this female background, but she is, when you get to know her, she's very androgynous. Mm -hmm. So she is really not this type. She does not fit in a certain 
goddess and what we ex what we what we think in our with our conditioned mind maybe around a goddess so she really embodies an a spirit that is really um natural and that can mean everything and it's she encourages us to when we talk about relationship or gender identity i think what i can say is that she encourages us to really listen to our body and to our nature what is what is natural for our soul how we express sexuality what is natural sexuality for us so mm -hmm. um and yeah when i mean we can we can associate her with ideas around pansexuality or something like that but i think even that um i think she encourages us to don't put a label onto something so she's really about this listen to your own nature, listen to your soul, what feels natural, what is natural, and that can evolve too. As I talked in um, our first talk, the soul has no gender, that the soul is in evolving, and so our gender identity can evolve too. And Diana is really um, encouraging us um, to come back to this natural connection to our body. And I mean, for me, this is, Speaking a little bit more personal, Diana is squaring my lunar notes and everybody who is a little bit deeper into astrology and especially into evolutionary astrology knows that planets that are squaring the lunar notes are so-called skip steps that are very important energies in this lifetime because maybe in past lives um, they somehow blocked our evolution. And so Diana is really this 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 um, idea not only in relationship to the body, but really this overarching theme to come back what is natural, to let go of certain ideas of the idea to fulfill certain expectations, really to allow myself to feel what is natural and to live according to my own rules. This is so important. And I'm in this lifetime, I have the feeling that I'm breaking free from thousands of years mm. in a prison. Mm. And I, one week ago in the middle of July, I moved um, away from the city. I lived in the inner city of Munich 10 years and I moved to Austria. That's a long story, but it was in Austria that Diana appeared in, here mm -hmm. where I live now. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that this move is not only, not only there, there are many different things that come together, but this move into an environment where is more nature and where I feel so much more freedom. And I know that it is all inner work, but our environment can support us. Um, within that and this liberation and I feel Diana so strongly with this move into an environment where, where there is more nature mm -hmm. and um, I think that this is my personal story but I think that it is reflecting a very huge collective story and the breaking free from systems and conditionings that are not serving our nature, our nature in all facets, our personal human nature, the nature of the planet, the, the, the natural um, magic order of the cosmos. Um, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and in the workshop, we're going to be, again, talking more about the the asteroid Diana in astrology and how how she manifests through the different signs and we're going to be giving different examples but do you want to just briefly talk a little bit more about your own natal diana and maybe a little, tiny bit about my natal diana so your your natal diana is it in capricorn then yeah it's in capricorn in the seventh house mm -hmm. 
squaring your notes. <laughs> squaring my notes in Aries and Libra, yeah. And with Capricorn or with Diana and Capricorn, we have this topic around Capricorn represents our conditions and how we learned from our upbringing to deal with the conditions of our life here on earth. So how we deal with time, space, and so on. And therefore Capricorn stands for our conditionings. I think I said earlier uh, yeah, for our condition, for our conditionings. And it, re it, yeah, it, it depends on in which environment we grow up, how this Capricorn archetypes shows up when we would um, grow up in a matrifocal environment, our conditionings were like, yeah, living in harmony with mother planet earth. But when we grow up in a patriarchal um, environment, it can be the case that the Capricorn archetype represents very much this energy. So this is really very important to understand that Capricorn is not patriarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Diana in Capricorn, for me personally, in the seventh house, it's really much about in the seventh house relationships, Libra archetype, also the expectations of others, this feeling of, okay, do I have maybe to um, fulfill certain expectations to be loved, to be safe, to be seen in a way? Mm -hmm. And um, there is so much about really um, having this feeling that. And my Diana is in my natal chart to retrograde. That means I have to look in my past and I really have the feeling that I, that I am in this life not breaking free from past lives where I was imprisoned into certain standards and rules and concepts and conditionings and very tight corsets in a literal way too. I remember a past life where I was. I could not breathe because of my social status and everything. And additionally to the past lives, I have the feeling that I breaking free from um, ancestral conditionings from my paternal line, from my father's side, where there was this harsh discipline. And this idea that you have to earn your right to be alive by working hard. Mm. And um, Diana really, or connecting with Diana, and of course, that is not the only thing, but this Capricornian energy to be so stuck in these conditionings. And then there comes this really wild under nature. And Diana reminds us, Diana and Capricorn reminds us, okay, um, are you living according to your true nature? And she reminds us on a very healthy Capricornian archetype, which is about the conservation of nature, the, the being the protectress of mother planet Earth. So Diana and Capricorn in an empowered way is saying no to Mount Olympus and saying yes to that wild forest and is aware of her responsibility, also in Capricornian word, the responsibility that she has um, in, yeah, that she has over um, nature, her own nature and her environment. So for me personally, it means a, a big lesson or lesson is um, to take responsibility for my body. I experienced eating disorders, burnouts, and so on. So to really be the protectress of my own nature and to not um, like the huntress who kills, 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 and who runs from one goal to another. So really embody this protectress more and more to really care for nature, care for resources this healthy, strong Capricornian energy. And Capricorn, uh, Diana and Capricorn can also be an, an environmentalist, for example. I'm not an environmentalist in that way, but that would be another example, to really be the protectress of Earth. 
And um, in the seventh house, it's so much about breaking free from conditionings in relationships. Um, really coming back to what is natural for me when I'm in a relationship with others. And yeah. Maybe also like the coming back to the yin, the yin version of the Capricorn, the like the gentle holding of your structures in a way that supports you and your natural way of being and supports your body and it's natural you know more of a balancing the cancer capricorn needs um nurturing yourself in some way yeah natural yeah. structures is a good um yeah, yeah. Capricorn word. yeah i yeah. think so yeah and of course, then if we're like having a full reading, then we would be looking at all yeah. kinds of, and I, yeah. didn't, I know your chart, yeah. so I'm thinking of all these other yeah. things. But yeah, yeah, we won't too. go there. <laughs> yeah. But I said, yeah. but yeah, maybe we can talk a little bit about your Diana because she's in Gemini on your midheaven, right? Yeah. So my, really briefly, my Diana is at 13 degrees Gemini, which happens to be right on exactly on my midheaven. And it, it completes a grand cross with my, moon which is at 11 degrees virgo on my 11 degree ascendant in virgo and then my sun which is at 14 degrees pisces and then my on my descendant and then my um my neptune which is at 16 degrees sagittarius on my ic so diana is like right at the top precisely at the top of my chart in this grand cross with these very 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 important parts of my my chart yeah <laughs> what i did not mention um because i just wanted to focus on the main points but my diana is conjunct neptune so neptune oh. is carrying my notes too oh. and he's querying my jupiter too oh, wow. so, oh, yeah uh, some yeah. more some more interesting things yeah um but yes with your diana i mean what i what i was so amazed by when i reread my paragraph about Diana and Gemini, and I read that before I knew you. Mm. Um, and when I read that, I thought, oh my God, that's so much about Martha because, and I, I just share this really quick and then I want to give you, um, <laughs> give you the space. Um, but it was really about, I, I have written down something like, to rewild and reclaim your natural voice mm. and to stop to um yeah maybe um really come back to your natural voice and that diana and gemini archetypes can have a very unique and untamed style of communication and maybe they talk in pictures or they have a very certain approach to gather information too so that there is a very um, maybe something like animal language or that there is a certain approach that others don't understand and that they tell the Diana in Gemini that she or he is stupid and so that the Diana in Gemini often tries to be extra good by really learning and studying extra hard and by that really not trusting your natural voice and that Diana helps you to rewild your natural voice and to stop trying to fit in a system of information and, and um, wisdom that is maybe not yours. And I know a little bit that you have these channeled books and that it took you some time to allow yourself to channel books. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah. And then my Mercury is in Pisces, right? So it's also related. Anyway, yes, yes. And the other thing that's really fascinating to me about my Diana placement is that I relate so, so strongly to being the protect protectress of uh, children in particular, but also um, the connection to uh, essentially midwifery. So, you know, in my own history, in my own work, I worked for a long, long, long time with children in the foster care system. And I was an adoption social worker and I did, I was a therapist for kids who were dealing with various aspects of child abuse and neglect. Um, <clears throat> so I, I did, a, you know, 
almost two decades of work with kids who needed to be protected. That was actually what I did. <laughs> so, and that's on, and it's on my day and it's on my midheaven, right? So it's like what I do in the world. I did that. That was huge for a bunch of years. Um, so that's fascinating to me. And but then, this yeah. responsibility aspect. Mm. You are the speaker and you take the responsibility, mm. 10 pounds mm. and see Capricorn mm. to be the protectress. Mm. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, and this also gets into other aspects of my chart, which we don't need to go into right now, but I also have tended to be kind of a like I guess you could say whistleblower type. So the one who would speak up and say, hey, no, <laughs> this is not okay. This is not being done right. These children need to be protected. Here you're 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 actually violating the law. Don't do it like, you know, and I would often be the one out in the the forefront saying those things which was not very fun for me a lot of the time but it's part of my nature to do that i mean also i have my pluto opposite eris i have my south node in aries my venus in aries on myself you know uh, anyway the so many anger yeah yes, but the yes. sacred anger um, yes. motive is and we often have that that in the chart um or we always have that that in a chart the the topics are reflected by different yeah. archetypes but with diana opposing Unethan and sagittarius right yes. so this this connection to a fire archetype to mm. this sacred anger mm. is i definitely feel it so um yeah. yeah but yeah i think we should dive deeper uh, into <laughs> these chart examples um in the workshop but yeah yeah it's so interesting yeah. how she can really help us um or her spirit or their spirit can yeah. really help us um to yeah to really tune into and that is what we want to do in the workshop to really tune into this really very on the one hand very earth-based and very grounded archetype but on the other hand she's reaching for the moon and she is the huntress mm -hmm. who is on she's running mm -hmm. but she's also a very calming down energy and a very soothing energy so she has these two components and that is something what i personally feel as so relevant too to really coming back to this balance between nighttime and daytime consciousness and this nurturing of the young of the of the beginning too and we are at the beginning of a new age mm -hmm. so she is the goddess of the children of of the young of the mothers who are giving birth of the young moon mm -hmm. so there is something about this seeding moment that mm -hmm. diana really is a yeah is a patroness for mm -hmm. in a way yeah and and i'll just say in general also i i feel like with each of these archetypes with diana but with any of them again you know the the healing and the wisdom that we each need we only can know in ourselves, and we only can know in each moment so i can speak for myself when i was first getting introduced to these goddess archetypes um the first thing that struck me the first kind of healing that i needed that is relevant to diana is with all of what are often called these uh virgin goddesses you know the goddesses like diana and um vesta and you know there's a few of them Athena. Pallas Athena, there you go um the ones these virgin goddesses are all about in various ways coming back into ourself into our own sovereignty and into our own wholeness within ourself and i again speaking for myself one of the biggest healing things that reconnecting with these goddesses did for me a few years ago was to help me in a sense come back into my own energetic bubble and i feel like as someone who has grown up identified as a female identified in you know as a helping not only a female but like moon i mean sorry my son in pisces in my seventh house and you know, all these things a very very giving female to have permission not only permission but an, an example like an energetic blueprint of what it means to come back 
into my own sovereign space and to be complete and whole within me, I needed that example and that modeling so badly. And these archetypes somehow did that for me. Um, that was just that was huge gift. <laughs> Yeah. So I feel like, you know, as we're holding this workshop and as we're doing other, the other things that we're planning in the future, one of the things I would emphasize is that we can't, you and I can't know what each person coming to the workshop or even you and I, what healing we will get or we each need in the moment. But I feel like each soul, each person who feels called and drawn to be with us, either live or with the recording anytime, you know, you will each know either ahead of time or in the moment or even afterward what those gifts and those healing intentions are for you. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to name that, that yeah. it's so powerful, so much potential for healing and, and, and we can't predict it, <laughs> you know, no. Which I, it's so exciting for me, actually. It's really beautiful that it's your soul. Each of our souls is the only thing that knows yeah yes and i think it's so much about this invocation to to really be open for mm. the healing and to invite this mm. these energies and to be really yeah curious to awaken them into ourselves yeah and yeah that is really beautiful what you said martha yeah wonderful great so um, anything else before we close, Rina? I'm looking forward to the workshop. I'm really looking forward to um, all of our collaborations, Martha. It feels so aligned. It feels so natural for me. <laughs> yeah. It flows so yeah. natural when I'm together with you. I think our Dianas are <laughs> our best friends. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm really looking forward to the workshop. And I think that um, to when when you can't make it live, it's recorded. So it's totally fine to um, um, to attend at any time you want. But I think it is really nice when you find the time to attend live because we want to do a little sharing circle at the end of the workshop which will not be recorded so that every attendant has or yeah everybody who's there has the has the um, opportunity to really share um, their experiences and I think that is always so nourishing and so healing too and because it is very private we will not record that that is just for people who have the possibility to join us live. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's going to be at 10 a.m. Pacific time, which is what time in Austria? This, um... In Austria, in Austria or Germany or Switzerland, it is um, 7 p.m. So 9 p.m. 19 7 p.m. Yeah. Okay. On September 14th, which is a Wednesday. And so that'll be 1 p.m. Eastern time on September 14th and it'll be for an hour and a half. So probably about the first, I'm gonna guess about the first hour or 70 minutes will probably be recorded. The the, the part of, of us talking about more in depth about what Diana is and Diana through the archetypes and, um, and then holding space for us to come into our own experience of the energetic of Diana, that whole portion and, and chart examples and all of that. That whole portion will be recorded. Um, and then we'll move into the last section of the time together, the last 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to guess, um, for sharing. And that yeah. part will not be recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Good. Yeah. So the link again will be here with this video to sign up. And um, We'll send out more information as it gets closer to the time also but uh uh yeah <laughs> wonderful and if there are other things that people are needing or wanting you know i think we're both very open to that and we have a lot of 
I think spirit is asking us to hold space in various ways. And I know for me, I love to hear from people what, what is alive and what is needed. Um, and that helps me to, helps me to work with spirit world to know what to bring forward when. So please be in touch with either of us. Yeah. Yes. And just one quick thing that came into my mind. I have a free gift. I have a little excerpt from my Diana book with a poem and a little introduction text to Diana. I'll link the free gift underneath the video. Yes. And um, yeah, just to mention yeah. that. Definitely. And I was, I was, I was wondering if you wanted to give that a that for this also yeah. and yeah. Um, I was going to say for the workshop I will definitely be sharing my excerpt from my book with people who are that. attending the workshop yeah so yeah. Uh, that'll be there too but the your free gift I'll put the link here for anybody watching this video and um, yeah it's, it's wonderful <laughs> I highly recommend it and yeah. I'm always um loving it if you yeah if you resonate with my astrological approach you can follow me on Instagram. And um, if you are German speaking, um, I have a podcast to Mercury Dreams. And um, yeah, but you can just write me on Instagram. And I give evolutionary astrology readings in English and German language. So yeah, and teach astrology. But Martha will link everything about me and our workshops. And I'm really happy that we did this. Absolutely. And if people are wanting to specifically look at Diana in your own charts, we both do readings. We both can hold space for that, um, along with obviously any other astrology readings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. All of the above. Great. And I'm at livingtheonelight.com and that will also be here. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very nice. <laughs>